I'm really happy to be here, guys, and uh, I'm kind of thrilled to, to start. But let me first give you some, some thoughts about what it's going to be. So first of all, the name of the presentation is Security 101. And by one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, and usually is meant like the very basics. So please do not expect like comprehensive list of things you need to do to have super secure systems. First of all, I can't provide this list. Secondly, I don't think anyone else could. So I'm going to do some kind of overview of what I would like that someone have told me when I was younger. And it's going to be slow. We're going to start slow, and there's going to be some practical items there. But mostly, I would like to, to make you thinking about what of the scenes I'm talking about actually applicable to your stuff, to your everyday job, to your systems, to what you're doing. So please don't think that this is like very trivial. It's very naive. It is. It starts very trivial and, and very naive, and it goes up. So give me some time, please. So let's let's talk about the agenda. I'm going to do a short overview of what cybersecurity means, how it looks like usually in people's eyes. Then I will try to cover the topics which actually matters. So which the topics where you need to put your attention on. And I will also try to give you some guidance and some advices where to look at. Uh, before we start, we're talking about cybersecurity. And this is an area which is usually measured by absence of something, by absence of data leaks, by absence of failures, by absence of hacks. And if your system never been compromised, it's considered as secure but it's considered secure. It doesn't mean that it is secure. If you had failures, yeah, you probably should be considered as insecure. And how these failures usually look like in people's eyes, like very trivial. We have some kind of bad actor which tries to get an access to a piece of software you actually own. Very trivial picture, very naive picture. But what I need to put your attention at is that this particular picture requires a few items. It requires deliberate desire to attack specific target. What actually happens, like the simplified picture looks a little bit different. Still bad actor, still tries to attack a piece of software, but this piece of software is not in space. It has some kind of surrounding. It could be systems which run your software, I don't know, Docker, Kubernetes. It could be a language interpreters, not Python. It could be a cloud providers like Azure, AWS. And they all are pieces which are vulnerable. So if I go back, you can see that like this picture is quite big. We're moving forward, it becomes smaller. And in reality, it's even more smaller. Because if we're talking about software, more realistic picture is like your piece of software, like the parts which you and your team actually written. Then we have some kind of infrastructure. Then we have a hardware. Then we have some kind of encryption, proprietary algorithms, and we have data center, physical one. And if you're thinking that this is like all the pieces on the left are out of your area of control and you shouldn't worry about them, you're probably right, but just probably. Why I'm telling you that probably right? Because if we're talking about infrastructure, for example, uh, Shai and myself, we used to work with a guy who during six months time frame found critical vulnerability in AWS and then critical vulnerability in Azure. So your piece of software could be safe, but the systems, which this piece of software belongs to could be not very secure. If we're talking about hardware, those of you who are in industry for a longer time of period could remember like 
this all rigged firmware in hard drives. You can remember meltdown and specter vulnerabilities in processors. Things happen. If we're talking about encryption, could you please raise hands who are in this industry for more than 10 years? Good. So you guys probably remember MD5 as a hashing algorithm, and everyone, everyone was thinking that it's a good idea to hash your passwords with MD5. Do you know what is MD5 used right now for? Just check sums. It's not safe anymore. You could have rainbow tables, you could have collisions and all this stuff. The same thing with SHA-1, which is 128 bits. So the tricky part is that the scene which is safe and secure today could become vulnerable tomorrow, and you have no power here. But you should also take into consideration that this exists. If we're talking about proprietary algorithms, my favorite example is PDF standard. If someone of you is curious and ever tried to read PDF standard, first of all, congratulations, I have much respect for you. It's like 880 pages standard as far as I remember. And it's so old that there are vulnerabilities which are exploited in modern software, but they actually caused by some kind of parts of software in this algorithm which were belonging to old Xerox machines and how they were optimizing pictures. So you could use some kind of software which is used by someone else and you couldn't be secure. And data centers, probably one of my favorite examples. If you're very curious, uh, you could Google by words pen tests through the toilet and try to find a Twitter thread where the guy actually went into secure data center and just proven that security is just imaginary. So you have all these parts and they are an actu actually not all. There are much more items there in this list. But it doesn't mean that you should worry about all of them because you probably shouldn't worry about the items which are out of area of your control. It's just, just worries. You cannot solve with worries anything. And my point is that you should worry about just two items. The first one is actual software you and your team produce. And the second one is people. And I'm going to probably start with Ledger. Uh, may I ask you to raise hands? Who knows a guy named Kevin Mitnick? Ah, we have quite a dedicated audience. So for those who don't know the guy, he started hacking systems in like late 80s, I believe. And he is a kind of synonym to, to word hacker. He was detained, he was hacking like pretty everything. And there is a very famous quote of him. It's like the weakest link in the security chain is the human element. So you could have very amazing software, amazing tool sets, but you have people. People are weak. Let's be honest. That's that's true. Uh, at and what I need and want to talk about here is the concept of security chain. It's, it's a very powerful analogy in my head. Because if you look into, into chain, you just need one weak link to jeopardize all strengths of the chain. Let's do a quick mental exercise. Could you please imagine like a big ship, like a huge one which moves containers from one part of the world to another? And you're about to deliver the ship to a customer. And then late last days before delivery, you understand that your chain is too short. And one of the managers goes and tells you, you know, we need longer chain. And you don't have tools, you don't have materials. And they decide like, okay, let's, let's introduce a few plastic links. Sounds silly, sounds stupid, but that actually happens in software. You do hot fixes. You do temporary solutions, which live with you most likely forever. And you don't need everything 
to be imperfect. You just need one tiny piece which is imperfect, and you need someone who's going to find this tiny piece. Everything else could be absolutely amazing, but for recipe for disaster, you just need one ingredient, one small piece. And in reality, yes, it's chain, but all the modern systems, they are a combination of chains, like many different chains. And I would like to ask you to, to make this other analogy. If you are familiar with automotive engines, there are many chains and belts there. And if one chain breaks, you're probably going to be not having AC working. Not comfortable, unpleasant, sad, but you can go forward. If the other chain breaks, your valves could meet a piston and you're done. So there are more important part in your system and less important part in your system. And it's actually applicable to each and every system. But as I mentioned before, you always need to be thinking that you don't need to be perfect. You don't do need to be perfect everywhere. And if you're imperfect in one place, you are imperfect at all. But let's, let's start being a little bit more specific. Uh, if we're talking about software, if we're talking about the code, which you and your team produce, it's actually also a chain. It's about code itself. It's about how you do code management. It's about how you build it, how do you deploy it, and how you run it. And here it starts a little bit interesting. Uh, you've probably seen this picture. This is XKCD Comics. And you probably think that this is like too much. That's not like that. But yes, it's like that. This small tiny piece is like crucial for many, many modern systems. If you're thinking that your software is different, you're probably wrong. Let me, let me be clear. You, you are wrong. You could try to see your dependencies, direct ones. You could try to see transient dependencies, dependency of your dependencies. And in the end, deeper or on a more shallow levels, you'll find this one small piece. But it's not about just having some kind of point of failure, but it's more about the fact that you don't own your software. You're combining it from different pieces. And if you remember the first picture I've been sharing with you, it was about bad actor deliberately trying to compromise specific system. And that's usually where CVEs come. They have scores, they have applicable uh, vectors and all this stuff, but there is a big difference between malware and CVE. CVE requires someone to find it, and exploit it. And if we're talking about malware, could, which could be in this package, in this tiny one, or somewhere here, it doesn't require deliberate action. And once you get a malware from a package, you're done. It automatically means that your system is compromised. Moreover, it means that like entire environment is compromised. And that's why malware, they come like skyrocketing because it's a game of scale. You can produce like one super popular, inject one small piece of malware in one super popular package, and you are about to have access in millions to million systems. You don't need to go over million systems one by one, trying to find weak point, trying to exploit it. No, you can just inject a piece of malware. And Malware is always a disaster. CVE, it's not always a disaster. And what am I trying to tell you about that? That you need to be very careful with what you consume. Like you do have many dependencies. And usually when I talk to, to people, to developers, and if you ask guys, like, how do you choose dependencies? Like, you need some kind of library which does something. How do you choose it? The most common answer I hear, like, I'm going to GitHub and see number of stars. Like, who does it like that? Ah, you all do. Just few of us are brave enough to, to show it. But 
think about it like that. You can buy, I don't know, hundreds and thousands of likes in Instagram or on Facebook for a few bucks. Don't you think you can buy stars on GitHub? You, you actually can. Said truth. Uh, for example, guys in front and side, if you are choosing packages which you need, you could probably go to npm chess.org. And you can see there like very comprehensive stats, how many downloads, how many stars, and all like uh, everything like that. But there is a very common attack which is called star checking, where you could pretend to sit in another repository which has many stars. And there is no strong correlation, there is no direct link in NPM. And you could publish a package, pretend to sit in Facebook repository, and NPM gonna show you that you have hundreds and thousands of stars. You could buy likes, you could buy stars. Should you trust them? Probably yes. Is it enough? Probably no. And what else? Just another example for front-end folks. You remember the time, probably five, six years ago, when everyone was talking about performance? There was a library called Immutable.js. Yeah, it was quite popular if you need to do performance code. Who of you could tell me how Immutable.js is named? Is it immutable if you need to, to type npm install? What, what is going to be the third word? Is it going to be immutable? Is it going to be Immutable.js? Is it going to be immutable dash JS? You don't know. You need to check. And there is an attack called type of squatting, where people pretending to have the same library with very familiar name, like just with a difference, like JS prefix, which is usually very familiar in front end world, like next, next JS. Which of these particular libraries? which of these packages belong to a particular library. You need to be very careful. So what I'm trying to tell you, you need to be careful with what you're consuming. You could write very performant, very secure code, but one weak dependency, one small tiny piece, which you include in your code, you're done. That's actually it. The other aspect about your code I would like referring to, you all know this practice, this approach, when people think about few parts of system as like critical and the other parts of the system like, ah, come on. That's like a piece of software which is running tests. It shouldn't be secure. It's just tests. But the fact is that code drifts and it's just a matter of time when someone is gonna reuse a piece of code from less secure system in more secure system. Just a matter of time. So if you are, if you want, and that's not requirement, and that's not a mandatory fact, if you want to have a secure system, you need to have rules. And these rules, most likely, I really beg you, don't need to have exceptions. All your systems might be secure. Otherwise, you don't have anything secure. But let's, let's move aside from the code. Uh, it's about code management. It's more about processes and people rather than the code, but still. Uh, you all know that like pull requests, code reviews are good practices. They are. But why? Just because some guys written many articles and tell them that code quality is better with code reviews, that you don't want to be shamed telling your friends that you don't have code review policies in your companies? No, it's not like that. Just imagine the fact that one of your colleagues' devices is compromised. They are not reckless or stupid, but they have compromised device and they could easily push the main. So that's it. You don't know about it. You need branch protection. You need code reviews, just not because you don't trust your colleagues, but because systems could be compromised and you need a spare pair of eyes to check it. Many people, they don't have like required amount of approvers. They don't do resets after yet another commit comes in. 
but don't think about this guy like lack of trust think about it just like yet another check yet another check to prevent a disaster that's that's actually it and if you don't have force pushes if you don't have branch protection if you don't have resets you actually don't have any assurance that you know what happens to your code like someone could do a force push in the middle of the night and you're not going to know about it that's that's sad but that happens so code reviews brand protection and all this stuff you can see on github gitlab whenever they are not just about developers wanted to to live with best practices they are practical and lack of them could lead to disasters uh, that's probably one of controversial slides and you're probably not going to able to see all the info here but i wanted to tell to to show you who of you knows about anything about signed builds like you oh we do have a few guys nice uh you need to have control over the artifact you have a code you have a build like the artifact and at least a few years ago i'm not completely sure that i know the current situation but at least a few years ago it was very common than mobile developers they were producing builds on their local machines and uploaded them in my head it sounds like very very dangerous because you you don't have control you're probably gonna have like a very nice very amazing code in the repository but you're building it somewhere else and it could be poisoned at that moment so there is a very nice approach very nice service and uh, it is used by npm at the moment and by homebrew it's called sig store it allows you to cryptographically using cryptography sign your build and make assurance that this particular artifact is produced from this particular code and that's nice but not so many people doing it yet and if you need just just another example for example next.js does it so you could be absolutely sure that if you are installing and using next.js's dependency it is built and you are getting the build which is an artifact from the source code which sits in a specific repository it gives you this assurance and this this is like very amazing opportunity but let's go forward. So there are more interesting stuff here. Uh, for those of you who are in industry for a longer time, period of time, you remember how deployment looked like years ago when people were uploading zip folders using FTP to servers. That was a standard de facto. Like that's what we were all doing. Like we are very fortunate that since changed like it was jenkins which were introduced and many many other stuff and now it's github actions which are allowing you to do deployment but let me challenge this one a little bit i'm also going to refer to front-end folks sorry i have like the, the most recent experience in front-end but that's how usual deployment for a front-end application looks like people are using if you're Googling like upload to S3. This is a GitHub action. Very nice one. It has 150 stars. Respectable. But that's not about it. Uh, take a look into this specific part. You are referring to action, which is actually a GitHub repository, and you're referring to master. Is it good or bad? It's bad because you are referring to something relative. Master today, master yesterday, master week ago, they are different. And what is interesting here is that you are passing their secret access keys and all the stuff. So if I have an access to this specific repository, what I need to do, I don't need to produce a build, do anything specific. I just need to put a, a one bad commit into main. That's it. You are done. 
So there is a nice practice, uh, which is called pinned actions. It's not about like deployment itself, but it makes your assurance a little bit more specific. You could refer to specific commit. In this case, you are more or less sure that you are going to use the code from specific repository to pass your secrets and stuff like that. Uh, I'm very fortunate to, to know the guy who written an open source library called Frisbee, which allow you not to manage all this mess, but you can like run a CLI tool and it, it's gonna change versions with hashes and it's, it's quite nice. But I strongly recommend you to read about pinned actions. It's like not, not a topic for a few seconds. It's a nice one. Next, running. Uh, Shay, you probably know the screenshot, yeah? Uh, that's a screenshot from, from Orca Security Platform. And uh, you're running your code somewhere. Let's imagine that this AWS EC2 instance is where your Python application sits. If you have vulnerability in your application, and I do have ability to get there, what happens? It's just, I don't know, it could be a build server. It could be a server which runs tests. It could be a piece of software which you think is not important. But what happens here on this picture? There is a SSH key which belongs to administrator, which has permissions in this group, which gives access to roles and policies, which give you access to every S3 bucket. So once I've gotten access to your testing server, I automatically have an access to each and every S3 buckets of you. That's sad, but that's not about like the piece of software you own, the piece of software you've written, but that's about the surrounding. That's about the configuration infrastructure and how you deal with the software. So, to isolate, to, to make yourself a little bit safer, you need to be careful with permissions. You need to know about least privileges principle. You need to know about zero trust concept when you assume that all the layers of your system are supposed to be compromised. You know that like, if you're writing backend code, you always assume that front end send you bullshit and you need to filter it out, you need to validate. But what happens afterwards, usually, you assume that the data which you validated, you can pass down to other microservices, to other systems, and they consider this data as safe. Yes, it is safe, but just for a moment, unless someone tries to send malicious data to them. So please be careful with that. And you've probably seen this kind of Errors if you're using some kind of static code analysis tools and stuff like that. Who could tell me what is wrong with that? I'm just trying to do console error for my front end code. And this static analysis tells me like, I'm trying to disclose some kind of information. Yes, I'm trying to disclose an error. What's wrong with that? Let me give you an example. Also referring to old times. For those of you who have been in the internet for years, you probably remember the times when there were no social media, when there were nothing like that, and when you usually communicate to other people using forums, online forums. And there was a one very popular forums engine called PHPBB. Probably some of you remember that one. Like, old one, very popular one. The problem is that PHP as a language especially at that time, was well known for being very, very fragile and vulnerable. Of course, you're combining SQL code, HTML templates, some kind of action handling validations and all the stuff in one file. Yes, it's, it's fragile. And there were exploits for each and every version of PHP BB server. What people started doing, they started, like if you go into online forum, it's very on, it's the very footer that was like, powered by PHPBB and then version. People started hiding versions. Smart, called security by obscurity, but it made things a little bit more complicated. Then people started making it look the same. But what other guys started doing? 
they started finding the differences in errors. So the way to disclose which actual version of PHP BB is running on this specific machine was to make it fail. And by error message, by failure, define that this is that particular version, and that has this particular CVEs, and that's how it should be exploited. So whenever you are leaking any data, that could be used against you. So please be careful about it. That's actually the last piece of information and the last piece of advice I shared with you, but let's try to summarize. I, I told a lot, and many of that stuff is probably not applicable to your systems, not applicable to your processes, but what I'm trying to tell that you should have processes, somehow defined processes. If you don't have processes, you don't own whatever happens to you. Like, you, you, you simply live in, like, anarchy and chaos. Make sure that your people are educated. They do know and understand, like, what is the price of being compromised. That they do know what they are doing. And make sure that whenever you're taking decision, you are taking a weighted decision. Not like, ah, let it go. That's actually, it's run no more silver bullets. And... Do we have a few more minutes? I just wanted to nice. I just wanted to tell you about like how sophisticated systems uh, and hacks could be. Just a few days ago, uh, the Wired like journal published an article about the guy who made Tetris Tetris game read leaderboard as a commands like original code of Tetris, written like 10 years ago, if you're doing a weird combination of 15 hundreds of actions, you could make it stuck a little bit and then read your leaderboard, like actual like name of winners and their scores as a set of commands. Yes, it's sophisticated attack. Yes, someone put hundreds of hours into that. But just try to imagine if people could hack Tetris, could they hack your system? Uh, you probably heard like a lot of noise about recent XZ vulnerability when everyone was talking about like that XZ is a library which is widely used in Linux systems and it was that close to be included in new version of uh, Linux distributives and just one random guy he noticed a tiny delay and he started investigating and he found like that there is a piece of malware code which was injected into that library. But that, that wasn't like just, I don't know, the attack which was done in the middle of the night. It was a very sophisticated attack. The guy was deliberately working on open source project for two years. He was writing tests. He was improving the library. He was doing a lot of stuff. He was a respectable member of community. And all that, all that, just for one particular month. And you never know when it happens and to whom it happens. You probably remember, like, years ago, the war, like, a very, very powerful, sophisticated attack to... Iranian nuclear plants and like it was called Stuxnet and all the stuff. And people still don't know all the details, but it was really sophisticated. Some people, most likely it's like government level uh, groups, but they were putting years and years of researches and attempts to implement stuff which works for this specific target. I'm not trying to scare you. Uh, most likely, majority of your systems are not so important and not so desired for hackers, for bad actors, for whoever. But if you think that like very sophisticated, very well-defined systems, which managed by respectable guys, they could be hacked, 
it definitely means that your system could be hacked. So what you need to do, you probably need to try to raise the bar a little bit. If it's trivial to be hacked, it's going to be hacked more likely. If you need to put years of effort for this system to be hacked, probably these bad actors, they're going to put this amount of effort, time, resources into someone others. So just make sure that you are thinking about security if it's applicable to you. That's it. I don't have any other advices. So we all know that the human is the weakest point in the whole security chain of an organization. And let's say I'm engineer manager, I'm a leading team of engineers, and uh, they're probably good guys, that, but they know nothing about security, or little to nothing. How would I, how would you say, raise the bar for them in terms of security? What materials can I provide for them? That's actually a very good question. Like, like Thank you. It, it deserves a cup. Absolutely. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you other chances, but this one is probably one of the most important questions, like how you educate your people and what you need to do. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. And but no, 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 please don't, please stop blaming me. And I believe no one has. Uh, you need to do what is applicable to, to you, to your team. Uh, first of all, I would recommend to start with basics. Like I've shown you like GitHub stuff and all this stuff since. Secondly, I would recommend you to start looking into our dependencies you are using and make weighted choices. And try to make sure that there is some kind of sanity check and control. Like if one person does something, there should be another pair of eyes who is checking. Like don't grant admin permissions to each and every one. Don't push code, I don't know, in the middle of the night, uh, between Friday and Saturday, just because you wanted to fix a bug on the last day of the sprint. It doesn't worth it. Try to, to build this culture of thinking what is going to cost. And that's, that's probably the most, the biggest impact you can have. Because like no one is perfect. And, but there is a big difference if someone used the library which was absolutely secure and two months later there is a vulnerability in that library you couldn't blame this person who did it in the first place but if one of your guys lost his ipad with ssh keys to production at the bar you definitely should blame him like there is a big difference between being reckless and being not informed enough just be human and understand that humans are weak. Try to, to guide them, try to build an understanding what to do. That's, that's actually it. Understood. Thank you very much. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your speech. It was interesting. Uh, I was wondering what is the fundamental difference of cybersecurity checks between mobile and web apps? And what is easier to hack? I don't think there is like there are any fundamental differences between like different kind of apps. There are a few which belong to like to platform specific. They could be platform specific. As I mentioned, like for example, if you're writing writing code in PHP, you are more you are less secure by default than if you're writing I don't know your code in Go. Yeah. There is a difference, but between mobile and web, just probably the fact that web systems say they are widely accessible. And if we're talking about mobile app, it sits in your phone, in my phone, in every other's phone. So you need to, if you're trying to compromise, you're trying to compromise a web server. If you're trying to compromise a mobile app, you're trying to compromise a build server. So that's probably the difference. Mm, thank you, uh, but I think that we can, I don't know, for example, try to hack some storage, for example, yeah, actually for mobile apps and uh, try to 
get some data from uh, this storage? Absolutely right, but uh, like that's that's just the techniques. They are applicable also for for web app. Like you can do, I don't know, XSS. Yeah, when you are trying to inject something in into client's browser. Yeah, and then you can get the session or anything like that. That's actually part of storage. Or you can try to hijack a session. In mobile app, yes, you can try to, to steal their data. Or they are, like, the fundamental difference in my head, mobile apps, they are more personalized. And they are much more difficult to be, to be compromised if we're talking about, like, wider audience. But I believe Shai is going to, to talk about AI, and I didn't want to touch this topic at all. But just, just imagine, that's a fact, that AI brings a lot of possibilities and a lot of capabilities to each and everyone. And you could go to, to ChatGPT, or you could build your, old, your own model, and you can ask her, like, I would like to have a script which is going to, to check for all the passwords, zip them, and send them to server. And you can write, before AI era, you could write, I don't know, 10, 15 scripts of that kind. Right now, you can write 2,000s of them. And you can infect stuff. So things become more and more complicated. And things which were secure or less or more secure yesterday, they are less secure today. And there is no big fundamental difference between different aspects. Unless you are, I don't know, living in government cloud with all these restrictions and guidelines other than that yes everything is similar it's just thank about you. techniques thank you we got yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we get a time just for the last tiny uh, or not tiny question we have a guy in the first row uh, yeah, hi. Uh, one question regarding the repositories, uh, yeah. because basically you can use something called SonarCube yes. in your pipeline, for instance, and then make sure, well, partially sure at least, uh, that some of the repositories are safe or at least considered safe. And this also applies, I believe, to uh, Docker repositories like Harbor, uh, where yeah. you also have, you know, like layers which uh, are known to be or considered safe. So I just wanted to add on top of what you said that not every, let's say, dependency always has to be very insecure by default. No, no, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that I was, if I was understood like that, like not, you shouldn't think about like all the dependencies as a risk. Like they are not all insecure. There are like many of them which are more secure than your own code. Like I, I believe there are millions of dependencies which are more secure than my code. But you just need to accept the fact that you don't own it. And you could be compromised just by the fact that you are using it. And if you are, just for example, if I'm using a library which you are maintaining and you're using all the best practices over your repository and all this stuff, and then you have the guy from his team who he, he tried to educate. And this guy, you're giving him an access to your repository. And this guy goes to the bar with his colleagues and loses his iPad with an access, and he commits like malicious code in your repository. If this act is going to be caught by tools you are using, amazing, great. If it could happen without you noticing, you probably shouldn't be considered secure. 